All right, so uh, if you're in this room, you're either, you either had nothing else to do or you're interested in uh, hoof protection options for endurance horses. And so, we're, you know, there's a, a lot to cover in this subject. Um, so I'm really going to give just an overview of what's out there, what's being used and why, what some of the advantages and disadvantages are. There are no recommendations here about, you know, what you should be using on an endurance horse because that's a very, very long conversation. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of factors to consider when we're, we're looking at hoof protection for endurance horses. And the first thing, of course, is breed. Now, we know that the endurance world is dominated by Arabs and Arab crosses. Um, for obvious reasons, they're genetically built for endurance, and that's what they do best. And so, you don't see, you know, quarter horses. You don't see a lot of other breeds in endurance, um, simply because they're they're just not durable enough as as a horse. Um, confirmation in everything. Confirmation always helps. Good confirmation, but if you don't have a, a horse with good confirmation, that simply means that whoever's taking care of the feet is going to have to make compensation, some sort of compensation for that, uh, that um, deviation, if, it, if, it's, if that's what it is. Um, fitness, obviously, you know, endurance horses have to be fit. They have to have a regular regimen of training. And most endurance riders are pretty committed to that. Um, but you've got to have a fit horse. You, you cannot um, have an overweight, fat horse and, uh, and succeed in endurance. And then rider fitness and ability is, is so undervalued. Um, because anytime, you know, there, anytime there's a lameness, who gets blamed? You know, whoever's taking care of the feet. But in the endurance world, I can tell you the majority of lamenesses are probably caused by the owner, by the rider. Um, imbalance, just not being fit enough. And the, you know, there aren't a huge, a, a huge number of super fit people in the endurance world. It's mostly people that want to compete in endurance, but they're not at that level. They just want to finish. They're not at the level where they want to be in the top 10. Or, um, and so those folks are super fit people themselves. So you've got fit horse, fit person. Um, you know, they can jump off a horse and, and tail the horse for 15 miles to, to spare the horse. Most people aren't going to do that. Um, but the rider fitness and ability really plays a huge role. And it's very difficult to be the person taking care of the feet when you know that this is a factor, a negative factor. Um, and then the distance, the sheer distance that we're talking about with endurance riding is, is, really, uh, is really critical because um, I didn't do the math, but somebody did the math and they, they found that um, in a 100-mile endurance race, they can exceed 80,000 footfalls. And you divide that by four, that means every foot is hitting the ground 20,000 times in, in, that, in that distance. And so that's, man, you want to find out if something's going to work or not. You know, the endurance world is a great testing ground for all sorts of things. Uh, and then weight. The weight factor is, is really huge, and we're going to talk about this at, at greater length. But the weight of the horse, uh, the weight of the rider and tack, and then, of course, the weight of what's on their feet is all critical. And, and the, the general tendency to the uneducated owner is, I want the lightest thing possible. And that's not always the best option. Trimming and the shoeing cycle. Um, typically, those things are planned out for the entire year um, based on whatever key events, uh, events the rider is participating in. And so we, we don't want to go into an event at, you know, five weeks of, of shoeing. We want to be shod, you know, maybe the week before. So you take the key events and then you just back up your, your, your cycle, your trim and shoeing cycle to match that. And that's pretty critical to do that all year long because if you just go kind of don't think about it, you can end up with... Uh, a lot of problems where the horse needs to be reshod, but it can't be, um, or it just got shod the day before, and now all of a sudden there's a problem. So um, you really got to figure all that stuff out. And then of course the terrain and the traction. You know, traction is really important, but we don't want too much traction. Um, and then the terrain, you know, there's everything from you know mud, water crossings, um, extreme elevation changes. Um, so all of that plays into um, what, how you're going to protect that horse's feet. And so this is the best illustration of what success looks like. Um, typically, a lot of riders that get into endurance, they just want to, they look at what the top 10 riders are doing. Like, that's what I'm going to put on my foot. That may not be the right thing. And so for every horse, it's different. And so it it's, can be a, a very uh, um, circuitous journey to, 
to uh, find what really works. So the majority of horses in the endurance world are still shod with steel. Um, and usually the, the steel shoes have some sort of concavity, some, some feature um, that's going to help prevent that. And we know that, uh, you know, Murphy's Law says that there's a rock out there with your name on it, and it will get wedged in that shoe, and you can beat on that thing, and uh, this, you actually have to take the shoe off to get that out. That's how bad it can be. So typically that's why they use um, shoes that have some sort of concavity or a rolled radius to prevent them grabbing onto anything. Um, sometimes aluminum shoes are used, uh, especially on the fronts. Uh, people will mix aluminum shoes because they're lighter um, and put steel in the, in the hinds. But um, this, this kind of goes back and forth like a lot of things in the endurance world. But the problem with uh, aluminum, aside from the wear, is that aluminum uh, emits higher frequency vibration. And if you, if you want to test that, you just take a, a bunch of different shoes and you just tap them on an anvil and listen to the pitch. Um, the, the rim shoe, you know, light shoes, rim shoes, aluminum shoes all have a much higher pitch. And so there's some thought that that's like a tuning fork on the foot. And so going to a light shoe is not necessarily going to help you. Um, it's it's going to give you less surface area for protection, um, but it's also um, potentially going to actually emit more vibration up the limb. Okay. Um, there are some people that, um, that are trying to, to get light shoes into the endurance world, and something like this is not really going to work because um, there's not enough coverage. So this is a, a very flexible shoe, um, supposed to wear really well, great traction, but not enough coverage for protection. And so, you know, an aluminum shoe typically is uh, like 3 to 6 ounces, steel shoe maybe 10 to 12 ounces, um, so about half the weight for aluminum, but, you know, aluminum, and again, a lighter weight shoe is not necessarily the best course of action. And so probably what you see more is just something like this, you know, good, um, adequate amount of coverage, um, you know, not too heavy, but in, in, in the endurance world, you know, light is important, but protection is more important. Okay, so on, on, on steel shod or metal shod feet, you don't see a whole lot of um, um, leather pads, but we need something to protect the sole and the frog for the most part. The reason you don't see a lot of uh, leather pads is when leather gets wet, you know, you go in a stream crossing, it swells, but it also compresses. And so that compression starts working on your clinches. Pretty soon you got a loose shoe and, and then it's gone. So you don't see a lot of leather pads used. You do see um, basically flat pads. Um, occasionally you, you'll see, um, like these concussion pads, um, but you have to be careful of these, um, these type of pads because, again, they compress. So anything that compresses, that sounds really great to an owner um, for concussion relief, but that also, that compression also works against you with the shoe as far as loosening it. So urethane pour-in pads are commonly used. Um, they also are used in a thin layer. This is probably the, one of the most popular things that I see now, steel shod with a thin layer of protective uh, urethane, not so much for um, any kind of support, but mainly for protection against sharps. And that's after 100 miles, okay? And you can also, you don't necessarily need to cover the frog. So these, uh, the, the pouring urethanes are pretty versatile for that. Um, so steel shod, uh, and aluminum combina steel combinations are still used quite a bit. Um, and it, it's just kind of what works for that particular horse at that. And sometimes, you know, one year it'll be, it'll be this package, the next year it'll be something completely different. So these, uh, um, there's two basic kinds of synthetic shoes. There's trace and trim, which is, uh, which this kind of falls into. Basically, you put the foot on the shoe, you trace a line outside the perimeter of the foot, and you cut off whatever's outside that line. Um, that has some advantages as far as the ease of use, but um, it also can result in weakening the shoe. Um, these shoes are pretty durable. They, they have a metal plate or metal reinforcement in there to hold the nails, but I've also been on rides where a um, horse will come in with six nails in the foot and, and the shoe's gone, and, and this is one of them, but all of them will do that. 
So this is another example of this trace and trim. Um, and they, they put extra material into the shoe so that you can, you can trim it off. Part of the problem is, as I said, you can actually weaken the shoe. If you trim off too much, you can actually make the shoe a lot more flexible. And flexible sounds good to some people, but flexible is generally not that great uh, in the endurance world. Okay. Um, this is a, a shoe that was very popular years ago. It's kind of been replaced, but uh, it's called a sneaker. And it's basically a, an aluminum plate encased in, in urethane. Um, it's a very much like a bar shoe. It's very rigid. It's somewhat heavy, but really great protection and great wear with this shoe. When I first saw this, I thought, well, okay, that just sounds like a bad idea to me. Um, you know there's a rock that's going <laughs> to find its way in there. Um, but this doesn't represent that. But the, the, the newer versions, they have a, a, a more of a, a shallow bevel to it so that it, uh, it doesn't you know, grab onto any kind of rock. And sometimes I'll just leave them open, or they can, you can put a pour-in uh, pad in there as well. OK. So that's trace and trim. And there's a, there's a whole bunch of trace and trim type shoes out there. Um, this is um, what we call a, like a bridge fit or a heel fit. Um, there's a couple different kinds of shoes. This is an Equiflex shoe, and it basically has these different widths of, of bridge that, that screw into the shoe so you can fit the heels really accurately. Um, super durable. They wear really great. You can glue them on. You can nail them on or both, um, like you see in this picture. And against the ground, they're super durable. However, all of these urethane shoes have one drawback. I mean, they wear like crazy, but they have one drawback, and they can be very slick. On, like if you're coming through a stream and all of a sudden you're coming out a, you know, a rocky granite uh, hillside, they can be really, really slippery. And so that's why some people, it's, it's really difficult to, to choose which one because they're certainly durable enough. They've got flexibility. They're able to absorb concussion. But if they're slippery, you know, it's not worth it. And then this is, a, this is a newer shoe by Easy Care. This is called the Easy Shoe. And same kind of situation. Back here, there's a keyway cut into this shoe. And you slide different widths of uh, this plastic insert. It's kind of like an SD card in your computer. And you just slide that in there, and you can, you can accurately fit the heels. Um, this is, you can see the metal reinforcement in here. Um, this here is a glue dam, so that when you put, if you glue it on, um, it doesn't encroach onto the sole. Um, but you can, this is, there's a lot of versatility to this. You can cut these clips off. You can leave them on. You can just glue the shoe here without putting any glue on the bottom. You can nail it. I mean, there's, there's a lot you can do with this. This hasn't really been tested in endurance too much, but it's a, it wears pretty well. It's pretty durable. Um, and you can fill it with uh, various types of fill. But this is the one of the, this is the, one of the, the ways that synthetic shoemakers advertise these shoes. They, they're flexible, so it's more natural. The, 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 the horse has more tactile sense um, in uneven ground. But this is not necessarily a good thing. Um, you know, you want some flexibility, but how much flexibility is, is right and how much is too much? Who's to say that, you know, the next step after this one isn't the step that pulls that shoe off? So flexibility is, is not always um, a good thing. But to getting that across to an owner can be pretty difficult because they want movement, you know, they, 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 they believe in, you know, natural movement of the, of the hoof, which, you know, we all should, but there are times when you want to kind of contain that or control that. This is the th what I like about this particular shoe is it will expand with the foot, um, and obviously you can see the wear is really good, but um, this method of fitting the heels is actually pretty good, um, so we'll kind of see how that works out. So boots are, are, the, are the third option um, for endurance riders. And boots are, there's kind of a love-hate relationship with boots because a lot of them don't fit very well. Um, if they come flying off, you know, by the time you go back and look for it, you're, you'll be lucky if you can find it. But that means you've got to carry an extra, which is extra weight. So boots, um, you know, a lot of people end up in boots when they don't know what else to do. Or, you know, they've tried everything else and nothing else works. Um, these particular ones are actually pretty good. Um, they're kind of made for endurance, and even though these cables occasionally fail, you can replace them. But they also have this, you know, the way they're designed, they really protect the foot pretty nicely. And so you'll, you'll see those used pretty heavily in, in, uh, 
endurance events. And then uh, Easy Care came out with this kind of boot, which is a, a really good training boot. A lot of people will use this for training. And it, so it's basically like a glue-on shell with a gaiter that allows it to, to just friction fit here, and it's held on with the gaiter. And so people will use this for training, and then they'll go to a glue-on shell for a, a key event. And so these are glued on um, using a very specific technique, and I suggest you look at the manufacturers and uh, look at their technique, because they, they vary a little bit. But basically, you're putting adhesive just on the upper edge here, um, and then putting it on the foot, and hoping that the adhesive doesn't end up down at the floor. So um, the first few of these I did, I, you know, being a guy, more glue is always better. And so um, I used a lot of glue, and it ended up underneath the, the foot. Because once you put that boot on, you don't know what the glue's doing because you can't see it. And so you really need to pay attention to that technique for putting these on. But they, they work really well, actually, surprisingly well. Biggest disadvantage of these is you're encasing the foot in rubber, which is never a good idea for, for any length of time. And so most people that use this type of setup are using it um, for a particular event, and then they're pulling them off afterwards. So two weeks is about the maximum you could leave one of these things on without seeing changes in the foot, um, both shape-wise and the moisture. It's, it's like wearing your boots with no socks. Any of you have done that as a kid, you kind of know what that feels like. It's, it's not too good. Um, but they're, they're, they're pretty durable. They hold up pretty well. So this is the other company. The other company that makes um, glue-on boots is the company that you first saw with that, uh, the Renegade uh, strap-on boot. So they make all these different colors, but it's basically the same concept. And um, they make this clear one, which I kind of like because then you can see where the glue goes. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't look too good. So you got to put a bunch of dirt on it so you can't see it. But uh, that works pretty well. Um, the difference between these two, there's a difference in philosophy. So you'll notice this one has this, this cuff that comes up. And it usually contacts the bulbs. And usually where there's contact on the bulbs, there's rubbing. And where there's rubbing, you know what happens after that. So I usually cut this off. Um, or I cut it to, to fit the, the foot. Um, the Renegade folks, they have this philosophy where they leave this boot open because they want water, any water that gets in, they want it to be able to exit. Um, and so they don't like that, that big flange on there. Even though you can cut it off, um, they, they prefer this type of design. And both of them work well. You'll see both of them on, a, on an endurance ride. They both work uh, quite well. Uh, but again, they are made of urethane, rubber, or some hybrid, and they can be slick on wet surfaces. So you've you got to take into account the terrain of specific events. Um, and sometimes, you know, a lot of endurance r uh, rides, there's a lot of elevation gain, or sometimes they're just relatively flat. Um, but you really, it depends on the terrain. So the road to success, again, is, is a very snake-like line. It's not, uh, it's not a matter of just looking and seeing what other people are using that are, that it's, that's working and then adopting that. Because um, some, of these, some of these top riders, you know, the people that finish in the top 10 um, fit horses, fit people. And I, I, I'd be willing to bet you could probably flatten a beer can and nail it on those horses, and they'd still do well. Because they're, they're just super well-built. They're highly bred. And you got a, a really talented rider for it. 